Psalm 139, continuing, this is just reviewing the verses that we read before. Verse 1, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path, my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. And that, as you recall, was a message we shared a few weeks ago on the omniscience of God. But now verses 7 through 12 is the next section. And this is going to talk about God's presence. And the, word, the theological word we use is omnipresent. It means omni, all, present. He's present everywhere at all times. So it says in verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight again for your word. And Lord, the, the teaching and instruction we have and how it reveals you your character, your attributes to us. And it gives us at least a limited understanding of the infinite God that we serve. And tonight, Lord, we are praying that you will speak to our hearts and, Lord, grant us the assurance we need where we need it. Lord, give us the instruction, the calm and the peace in the midst of the storms of life family issues, church issues, government issues, the state of our country. Lord, you know all those things and all the concerns that are unspoken upon our hearts, the needs that others may not be aware of. Lord, you know them better than we do. And we're praying tonight that you will speak to us and again in this dark time to make your presence very well known. Apply your word now to our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Omniscience, the God who is there. I'm borrowing that title from uh, Francis Schaeffer. He was a writer. He's with the Lord now. But he was one that he talks about the God who is there. This speaks of God's existence and that he is not only there, but he is not silent. But tonight we're going to look at this, the God who is there. And... Compare a couple things. You know, we live in a day in which the environmental movement and concerns are massive, are they not? They are religious. The environmentalism is a religion. They have a God. In fact, Romans 1 tells us that they worship the creature more than the creator. And that is what the modern day environmental movement has become. Now, there are different extremes of it. But when you look at it, ultimately... They're worshiping something God said should not be worshipped, and they're concerning themselves with things that are of secondary concern. Pantheism is that worldview that says God is in all, or God is all and all is God. Panentheism is the one that says God is in everything. Well, in one sense, God is all, well, he is all-knowing, he is all-present, he is all-powerful, but that's not what they are talking about. But here's the truth. God, all of God's, God is in all of his creation. That is true. But God is separate from all of his creation. He existed before it. He is above it. And he will exist after he, by the power of his word, destroys all the creation we know today. And then he creates a new heaven and a new earth. And that new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. 
So we have to understand what we think here as the modern day environmental movement. It is a religion, but it is a false religion. And we as Christians, we want to worship the God, that yes, he knows all, but the God who is there. You don't worship the creation to worship the God. You worship the God who made all of that creation. So where, let's suppose, and this is what the psalmist introduces here, he starts out with a few questions. Now these are rhetorical questions. The answers are automatically given because he gives some impossibilities but when he says in verse 7, Whither or where shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee or try to hide from your presence? And the answer to those questions is a rhetorical nowhere. There's not a place in this universe that I can go and I will escape your presence or your knowledge. And this is speaking literally of his presence, which means he is there. Well, how can God be there and here and over there all the same? Because he is equally present in all places at all times. I don't understand that. You know, tonight, on the way to church, just before we left, you know, the Dallas Cowboys were doing something fairly remarkable against the only undefeated football team in the season thus far. And if there was some possible way for me to be there and here at the same time, I don't know but what I might have been tempted tonight. But I can't be. We can only be at one place. So it's hard to comprehend a God who is there. He is there where we need him to be. He is present where we are. He is there with our loved ones. For better or for worse, he is there. And we can pray and share our burdens before him and he can work even when we're not there and we don't fully understand what's going on. For loved ones in the hospital and we can't get there. These times are strange. Nursing homes, I, I, I read more and more about these folks in nursing homes, the struggle they're having because of the separation from loved ones. But God is there. And he can comfort hearts and he can do things we cannot do. So as you come into these questions, understand the psalmist is reassuring here. As the better he knows his God and the better he understands him, the more at ease he feels, especially as he approaches the latter part of the chapter. So where shall we go? And now he goes in verses 8, 9, and 10, and he is going to give us some information. We're going to give what are the dimensions of his omnipresence. Is it limited to the earth? Well, he says this, and he's going to go on two different axes, the, the, up, the vertical axes and the horizontal axes, axis. He says this, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Now, he knows he can't ascend into heaven. He's using impossible situations. But he said, if I did, God, you would be there. And that, you say, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. That's his throne. That's his habitation. Yes, but, but then notice what he says, if I de descend into hell or Sheol, the place of the departed dead. He, he says, if I go there, Lord, you are there too. So he goes from the, the deepest to the highest, and that implies everything in between. Lord, you're there. I can't, I can't go that route and get away from you. But then he goes on in verse 9. It says, if I take the wings of the morning. Well, the wings of the morning is a Hebrew statement that, that speaks of if I go eastward, where the sun, the day begins, the morning rises, the sun, morning sun rises. Or if I go to dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, that would be to him at this point. It would be to his west. So this is the horizontal axis. If I go as far to the east or as far to the west, there's nowhere I can go and outrun your presence. This implies this. When you look at those two, I can't go anywhere and escape your presence. Now when you look at these truths, it begins to give you the comprehension of how great our God is. You say, well, why would a man want to escape the presence of the Lord? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, we just looked at this a few weeks ago. But Genesis 3, you know the, the chapter. Adam and Eve in verses 1 through 7, they sin, their eyes are opened. 
But then in verses 8 through 10, the Lord God comes down, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, to commune with them in the evening. And they heard that, verse 8 of Genesis 3, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think they truly hid? Where can I go from? No, I can't go. Even hiding in the, in the bushes or in the tree, you're not going to hide from God's presence. And the Lord God said unto Adam and said, called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He knew. He's omniscient, remember? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. You see, God allows us to acknowledge our sin and our wrong. But why did Adam and Eve seek to hide themselves from the Lord? Because they had sinned. And in the very first family, in the very first garden and setting that God had placed them in, they could not hide from him. Turn with me over to the book of Revelation. In chapter 6, this goes down toward the end of time. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 and following. Remember, this is the beginning. 6 through 19 is the tribulation period here on the earth. Revelation 1 to 3, that's the closing. That represents the church age. Chapter 4 and 5, that's the rapture and the church is seen in heaven. And then you come chapter 6 through 19, that is the tribulation here on the earth. And verse 15 of chapter 6 describes this under the sixth seal that is opened. It says, And the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in dens and the rocks of the mountains and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Where can they go to hide from the presence? While they want to go, they even desire that the mountains fall upon them and kill them to hide. Even there they cannot escape the Lord's presence. Turn with me to one other place. Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23 it's going to, the reason I'm reading this is because I want you to understand something else. When we look at the world around us and we see religious systems that not only do they misinterpret the word of God, they totally deceive their followers. They twist the word of God, deceive people into a lie. And you ask yourself, what's going to happen? How in the world can this proceed? How can God allow this? Well, understand this. While God may be silent, he's, <coughs> he is not absent. While he may not be acting while, uh, on our time frame, it does not mean he will not. Look at verses 24 and following. The Lord God speaking about those that are taking his word or his revelation and changing it. He said, Can any hide himself in, in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said and prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name before, for Baal. And prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream, and let he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. 
Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. What is God saying here? He's saying, you're not going to take my word and my revelation lightly, and then you go and you pervert that before the people and cause them to err. He said, I know that, and you're not going to profit from it. You're not going to escape it. Now, when you get to the end of going back to Psalm 139, when you get to the end of the chapter, the psalmist seems perturbed and concerned about God's glory, about his word, and the way the enemies of the Lord are perverting it, and they are, they are speaking evil against him. Well, we can rely on this. God knows. He is present. Now, here's a thought for us tonight. Do you think God is present at the polling places? Do you think he knows what that exact count is supposed to be? I think he does. Can I say that one, one? No, I can't say that. I don't know that. I know that hearts are disturbed. But in that, as I mentioned this morning in the email, God is on the throne and he is an omnipresent God. There is no place you can go and hide from him. And it doesn't stop there. Not only is he everywhere, but what is he doing? Let's look here at, in verse uh, 10 and following. He is not sitting idly by. In fact, he said that in Jeremiah. You think you can do this with impunity, but you can't. Verse 10 says, Even there shall thy hand lead me. And thy right hand shall hold me. That means hold on to me. If I ascend to heaven or descend into Sheol, if I go as far as I can east or west in any direction, there's nowhere I can go from your presence, even in those places. Lord, your hand is going to lead me. And your hand is going to hold on to me. So when we are in his will and in his presence and doing that which he, he will lead us step by step, no matter how dark the days, no matter how difficult the circumstances. 2020 is a good year for that assurance, isn't it? Good night. We start off with the uncertainty in, the, in Congress and then the coronavirus, then the economic downfall, and then, of course, all this the turmoil as far as how to get society back to functioning and then this to top it all off this election and the year's not even over yet isn't it good to know that God is there and that his hand will lead us and it will hold on to us he says in verse 11 if I say surely the darkness will cover me if I will if I'm out of God's will and I want to hide from him one of the things people will do is they will find a dark place and try to hide out in the darkness. Well, there's a little problem with that. He said, even the night shall be light about me. Now, that's strange. Last night, late at night, I was downstairs studying, and, and I heard what sounded like something messing around on the back porch or something. And I said, that's strange. So I got up and went up there, went outside, and turned on lights and flashlight, and I couldn't see anything. But I couldn't see very far because it was pretty dark. But when it says that even night shall be light about me. The idea is this, that even night is light to him. In fact, verse, 11, verse 12 says this, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. He doesn't need a flashlight. He doesn't need the sun. He knows all things everywhere. And there is no such thing as darkness or light. This is not speaking spiritually speaking like the darkness in terms of evil. This is talking about the physical darkness. There's no such thing as far as God is concerned. So when we think of these indications... Here are some things that we can bring out for our lives. Number one, 
God has an, an abiding presence. And that abiding presence is everywhere. There's nowhere you can go in God's will or out of God's will and leave that, that abiding presence. It's not say if I go into heaven, you will be there. It says, no, you are there. If I descend to Sheol, you are there. I go as far as I can east or west, you are already there. Nowhere I can go and escape your presence. So it's an abiding presence. And then his continuing activity, no matter where I go, his hand will guide, that's guidance. And I say, what if, I run, if I'm running from God's will or his presence? Well, we'll see that in a moment. Because there are some of God's servants who tried that too. But his hand was there to guide. And your hand will hold me. That's preservation. God always sustains. Otherwise, we would be in trouble, wouldn't we? And then his unlimited scrutiny over everything. You see, you and I, we have a limitation with what we can see. In the darkness, we can't see very much. It'd be, we'd probably be shocked if we knew all the stuff that goes on in the dark. All the things that go on out of our sight because we are elsewhere. You saw the frustration of those who were assigned to watch the polls. And they said, we can't see anything. We're too far away because of COVID-19 restrictions. How do we know what that ballot was or what it's for and where it went? Frustration. But God's scrutiny is not limited by distance by light or darkness, and those things. So when you understand those things, it's to bring us to certain conclusions and certain implications in our lives. Number one, you can't get away from God. So how do we know this? Well, ask Jonah. We're not going to turn there. We're not going to retell the story. You know the story. Here's a prophet of God that God told him, you arise and you go to Nineveh and preach against it because I'm going to destroy it. Jonah rose, and the Bible says he went to Tarshish to flee from what? The presence of the Lord. Well, he went there. The Lord was there. The Lord was in the ship. The Lord was in the fish. And the Lord was on the beach where the fish vomited him out. And guess what he said to him the second time? Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh and preach against it. You can try to flee Ask Jonah, if you'd flee in rebellion of the Lord, it's not, go, it's not going to work the way you thought it would. Abraham, he, he tried to, to go from the presence of the Lord, and we saw the deception as he went down into Egypt to escape the famine. That's not where God wanted him. God wanted to show him, I can preserve you in the land that I took you to in the midst of one of the worst famines that affected that entire region of the world. But he left. He went down to Egypt, and then he lied, said, told Sarah, tell him you're my sister, not my wife. You know the story. How about David? Was his sin against Bathsheba's husband, and with Bathsheba, was it hid from the Lord? No. He was there. You can't get away from God. Achan. You can't, he, he tried to hide those things that he stole in that, in that battle. And it brought defeat. But on the other, side, the other side of the coin, you can say this. You can't be away from God. Ask Elijah. Remember Elijah after that tremendous battle or victory, spiritually speaking, over the 400 prophets of Baal? They prayed and prayed all day and fire didn't come down from heaven. Elijah prays and he, after he soaks the thing in water and all this other stuff. Makes it about as hard as it can. Then he prays and the fire comes and consumes everything. And the prophets of Baal are killed. Tremendous spiritual victory. And then, you know what happens. Jezebel, she gets upset. And she says, of a surety, by, by tomorrow this time, you're going to be dead. So he flees and he becomes despondent. He becomes uh, depressed, in a sense, before the Lord. And he goes down and the ravens feed him. The ravens feed him. Then 
The Lord says, okay, now you're going to take a 40-day journey down to the same place Moses went to when he was struggling. And then when he got there, what did the Lord say? Elijah, what are you doing here? So, Lord, I'm the only prophet remaining. Remember we went through this a few, a few weeks ago? He wanted to see the Lord. And the Lord was there. Daniel in the lion's den. If you're in the center of God's will, there's nowhere that you can go that he will not be there. Even in the dangerous place that is life-threatening, think of his colleagues there, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown in the fiery furnace. God was there. In fact, when the king looked in, he says, didn't we throw three men in there? Well, why is it that I see a fourth one? One is like unto the Son of God. And then there's Stephen. Even in death, God is there. The Lord, the Lord was there in a special way during Stephen's death. So we can look at these circumstances and you can say, God, where are you when we're hurting? Where are you when we're suffering? Where are you when things are not going the way we think they ought to? Where are you in the 2020 election? Where are you in the coronavirus? And you can start listing all those things that are heavy on your heart. And not only is he there, but verses 1 through 6, he knows all about it even before it came up. He knows the outcome of this election. He knows the outcome of all those political concerns we might have and some that we may not even know exist. He already knows. Thou God seest me. That is a comforting thought. Verse 1 started out, O Lord, thou hast searched me, and you have known me. Thou, God, you see me. You know every step of the way, every thought I have. So as you're facing these trials, as you're facing these difficulties in these days, let me encourage you to do this. Go back to the God that you know. That is the God of Scripture. It's the God who created everything. He's the God who sustains everything. He's the God who is there. The question is, do we believe that? See, this is where faith is tested. Faith is tried, as we saw in the case of Abraham. Abraham, can you trust me in the tent? Lot didn't do that. He had to go for other things, and it did not end well for Lot. <coughs> but Abraham, he trusted the Lord, and God showed himself faithful. And the good thing for us, the same God that was on the throne back for Abraham, for Joshua, for Moses, for Jonah, and all these others, he's the same God on the throne today. And he knows your concerns, and he hears our prayers. Trust him. Turn to him. And acknowledge and sense his presence because it is there. This is not just a feeling we get like some people get that so-and-so is there or that. No, but God is. Praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight that you are the God who is there. As we saw in verses 1 through 6, you know us completely. Not only what we do and say, but Lord, you know even the unformed thoughts and words before they form themselves in our minds and come out our tongues. Lord, we know that you are present no matter where we go. Vertically or horizontally, you are there. And your hand is guiding and your hand is preserving. So Lord, may we boldly face the battles of each day knowing and trusting that you will never put on us more than we are able to bear. And help us, Lord, to turn to you and depend on you and glorify you so that others through us may see Christ and believe on him. Lord, we again come to you tonight in prayer for our country. Lord, the, the problems of America go way beyond this election and political parties. It goes, as we shared Wednesday night, 
to a people that have turned from the principles that this country was founded upon and we are a divided nation. And I pray that somehow that you would bring revival to our nation. But Lord, in the absence of that, as we see scripture, we don't have great hope of that. But Lord, I pray that you would help your church to be faithful and to shine brighter as the days grow darker until Jesus comes to take us home. And with John, we pray, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that assurance, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.